So let's delve into the concept and start to, to understand why we see this response in terms of ventilatory mechanisms. Why does VE show this response? <coughs> well, first thing is that if we go back to what's happening in the muscle, we recognize that lactate is, is, is being produced and that in order to get lactate out of the cell, remember we want to get it out of the cell, in order to do that, it, comes, it has to come into contact primarily with bicarbonate. So bicarbonate is a natural buffer. And what the bicarbonate does is it creates a pH gradient between the intracellular and the extracellular environments. So the cell will be more acidic than the, um, the, the, in the extracellular environment with the bicarbonate being present. That allows for the lactate to come out of the cell and to be buffered. The bicarbonate interacts interacts with the lactate. Net result is we produce two components or compounds. We produce sodium lactate and carbonic acid. Now the sodium lactate is, 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 a, is an important consequence but it's not the bit we're interested in in terms of ventilatory control mechanisms. The carbonic acid itself is now acted upon by a key enzyme which is carbonic anhydrase. Remember that the enzyme never ends up in the final outcome of the reaction. But by interacting with carbonic anhydrase, we end up producing CO2 and water. Okay, CO2 and water. Now remember how important the, the um, CO2 has been to all our discussions up to this point. That means, quite clearly, we've got a number of sources of CO2 occurring under exercise conditions. If we think about exercise below the lactate turn point or below the ventilatory threshold, it's perhaps easier to think about, about the lactate turn point at the moment because that's something that's, that's more understandable before we get to identifying ventilatory threshold. In, if we think below it, there is really predominantly only one major source of um, carbon dioxide, and that major source of carbon dioxide comes from the TCA cycle. Remember, CO2 is produced through the process of aerobic metabolism of glucose and or glycogen. But as the exercise intensity increases, there's a greater reliance on, on substrate level glycolysis. That, remember, produces CO2 more rapidly, because glycolysis works far more rapidly in terms of ATP generation than um, the TCA cycle. But once we go beyond the lactate turn point, you've now got excess lactate being produced because we're working glycolytically. Okay, so the lactate concentration has gone up. Remember, we've seen that previously with our lactate curve. That lactate is buffered by bicarbonate, this carbonic acid that is produced is acted on by carbonic anhydrase to produce CO2 and water. There is your second source of CO2. So submaximally, below this point, there is a matching between VE and CO2 because primarily the, the metabolic process of um, oxidative phosphorylation in terms of using glucose and glycogen meets the energy demands of the muscle. But as the intensity increases <coughs> and that the, the, the aerobic generation of ATP cannot meet the demand of the muscle, there's an increased reliance on substrate level glycolysis. The net result is that you now produce CO2 but primarily produce lactate as a consequence of that. For all the reasons we've seen in previous podcasts, the net result is that, that lactate is enacted upon bicarbonate in order to get it out of the cell, produces carbonic acid, acted on by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Now you produce your second source of CO2, and you have disproportionate rise in CO2 against minute ventilation. So it's a really logical concept, and something you can see in all ventilatory data um, in our healthy population groups that we, that we assess under laboratory conditions. So, quite clearly, if we go above a lactate turn point, and again, I'm using lactate turn point as our example, so we see ventilatory threshold. I just want you to remember that they are, in essence, identifying the same point, the transition from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, the aerobic capacity. 
Once we go beyond that point, there is an imbalance starts to occur really between O2 and CO2. So it's an excess CO2 being produced um, in comparison to the amount of O2 that's coming in. So the QCO2 is disproportionately higher than the QO2. So QCO2 now rises. And again, we plot that against VE, the CO2 is disproportionately higher than the minute ventilation. So the, the, the rationale behind this is, is fundamental. And if you think about that, you think about why this is now fundamentally important in terms of clinical population groups. Because in clinical population groups now, you can understand what the control mechanism is. Whereas in a blood sample, you don't get to see the minute ventilation. You don't get to see the CO2 output or the O2 output. Now you can start to identify if that, if that threshold point, that transition occurs at a very low um, percentage of the VO2 max. So the fractional utilisation of VO2 max is low, let's say 50% of VO2 max. In a blood sample, you would merely have the lactate concentration. Now you can start to understand, well, why? Is it because there is a mismatching between VE or, and CO2? Is it because actually the O2 that's being produced is, is, is very, very low in proportion to what we're being demanded at the muscle? In other words, you can start to see inside the data. And this is why it's, it's really being pushed as... Um, a method for using in clinical groups and also for using in athletic population groups ahead of taking those blood samples that we've addressed previously. So this just summarises the, the whole um, process of ventilation control and just puts it into context for us in terms of what is driving the minute ventilation response and what is driving the disproportionate response. So remember, below ventilatory threshold, below lactate term point, remember they're trying to identify the same point, the aerobic capacity. Below that, then there is a matching of VE to CO2, okay, because the CO2 rises in proportion to exercise intensity. There isn't a second source. The second source starts to come into play when the exercise intensity cannot be matched. And so now what happens is we rely more on anaerobic glycolysis, the anaerobic glycolysis, that's fine because it produces lactate, but the lactate that is produced, remember we move it out of the cell, using bicarbonate to create the pH gradient, the net result is that then is acted upon, um, we get um, sodium lactate and, 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 and carbonic acid through the interaction of bicarbonate. The carbonic acid is then interacted upon by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, CO2 and water. And that's what drives up that disproportionate response in terms of CO2 against minute ventilation. Now, this is an alternate way. Now, the reason for putting this in is um, on your journey at the moment in terms of exercise science, the, most of the work you've ever done has been using Douglas bags. And Douglas bags are a fantastic way, and they're still recognised really as being the gold standard approach for collecting uh, expired air. Primarily because you can understand where things are happening. You can, you can see it. You're not using a black box. But what tends to happen in particular clinical and athletic population groups is we use breath-by-breath -breath data. And when we use breath-by-breath -breath data, one of the ways that's been identified or been proposed for identifying um, the ventilatory threshold is, is what's called the V-slope method, uh, proposed by Beaver and colleagues back in 1986 in a publication in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And what they suggested is you can do is just plot VCO2 of, of versus VO2. And actually, if you think about that, that, that makes a lot of sense. That, again, minute ventilation, VE, shows a linear light response against VO2. So if you just plot VO2 versus VCO2, as you see here, using minute ventilation, uh, using, sorry, breath-by-breath -breath data, you can see quite clearly there is a, a sudden kick. That there is, again, a disproportionate production in VCO2 against VO2, the ventilatory threshold. Now, this is much harder to do with Douglas bag data because you get snapshots. You also have to say to yourself, well, hold on, why is, why is mint ventilation not being shown here? Why are you showing us VO2 versus VCO2? And you'll see why. It's because in a, in a conventional world, then the ideal response would be exactly as we've been seeing to see that disproportionate increase in VCO2 to minute ventilation. As with the blood lactate data, that is not always obvious. As much as the control mechanisms for ventilatory 
drive are absolutely clear, remember what you're doing is you're recording um, expired air at the mouth. So VO2 reflecting what is going on at the muscle in terms of QO2 and VCO2 versus QCO2. It's a surrogate indication, so it's not always clear. So alternate means have been put forward, and this is a, an alternate approach that you can certainly use with breath-by-breath breath data, and certainly does seem to be quite a good approach.